so we got, there's a lot of people right here that can help you. Anything you need, uh, we'll try to provide. We're glad that you're here. Before we actually get started, uh, there's a group from Georgia that's here, and uh, we had a really tragic occurrence recently. A uh, high, uh, well-known, great church pastor uh, unexpectedly uh, during a surgery procedure that we thought would be routine passed away. Uh, and he was one of the main catalysts for their group being here. And uh, we really miss Randy Bellamont very much. But his group is here, a lot of people from Georgia. Their district superintendent is here. And uh, Mark, I'd like for you to open us up in prayer. Would you do that? And uh, Mark Merrill, Dr. Merrill is a uh, is a, uh, one of the, he does a lot of things, but he is really committed to this Acts 2 principle, and he is replicating this and teaching it himself in the Georgia district. And so we're glad to have you, love to have you pray. And, and just we remember Randy today. So, Amen. Would you stand with me, please? And let's just, as we go to the Lord and pray this morning, would you just raise your hands? It's not for the next two process, but the help of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, today we can be in this place. Lord, be with us today, Father. We'll be coming with our hands lifted, our hearts lifted, our praise offered to you, O God, and you will come to be with us today. All that happens. The material that's here will be a catalytic moment for us in our vision of the church and the people. And to create a lot of things and health and strength. We will make a difference in churches. Lord, we will ask you during the Lord, would you please create an extra two moments in our hearts as we open this material. And Father, today we do thank you that you are our helper in times of grief and sorrow. You can bring tremendous consolation to our hearts. And God, we lean upon that today, not only those in Georgia, but all those who are here under our and struggle. We give you praise and glory and honor for all that you're going to do these coming moments yes, and days. We ask that you'll help us now through the person of your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The reason you're here is because, in my opinion, you are a learner. And I honestly believe that all leaders are learners. And when you stop learning, you're going to stop leading. You're not going to hear some revolutionary things that you've never heard before. That's not our objective. Church health has been studied by a lot of different people. And a lot of people kind of walk down the same path. I was reading a book recently that it's not really a, a new book. It's been out a few months, uh, a few years actually. But I noticed how this book encapsulated some of the very principles and thoughts that we wanted to transfer to you today. This author is the Vice President of Fuller Seminary. I don't know if you read Canoeing the Mountains. He takes the principles of when President Jefferson asked two men to get a team, actually one man, and he brought the other team member, to move across the continent of North America. And this is this story of how Lewis and Clark moved from a transferring their whole thought process from how to move in the rivers to move in the mountains. And I brought a couple of quotes from him today as we get started. And I wanted to read just a few things as it sets the stage for what we're going to do for the next two and a half days. Sociologists and theologians refer to this past period as Christendom. Christendom, in his explanation, is the observance of the fact that the 1700 year long era with Christianity at the privileged center of the Western culture life is what he called Christendom. Christendom gave us blue laws, the Ten Commandments in school. Christendom gave us under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. 
and exhortations to Bible reading in national newspapers. In fact, there's a copy of the Los Angeles Times from December 1963 that had a list of daily Bible readings in the Los Angeles Times for the upcoming week. Can you imagine the Los Angeles Times exhorting people to read their Bibles today? It was a day when city fathers laid out the town square with the courthouse, the library, and the first church of, you fill in the blanks, within the center of the city. Christmas. When cities are now considering using eminent domain laws to replace churches with tax revenue generating big box stores, when Sundays are more about soccer and Starbucks than about Sabbath, when Christian student groups are getting de-recognized on university campuses, when the fastest growing religious affiliation among young adults is none, when there is no moral consensus built on Christian tradition, even among Christians, when even a funeral in a conservative beach town is more likely to be a Hawaiian-style paddle-out than a gathering in a sanctuary, then Christendom, as a marker of society, has clearly passed. Professor Guder, in the missiological context, wrote this. If Western societies have become post-Christian mission fields, how can traditional churches then become missionary churches? Alan Hirsch in The Forgotten Ways put it this way. Missional church is a community of God's people that defines itself and organizes its life around its real purpose of being an agent of God's mission to the world. In other words, the church's true and authentic organizing principle is mission. When the church is in mission, it is the true church. The missional frame for the church is even more critical when we consider the speed and the breadth of the changes that are happening in our world. There is a call. Listen to this statement. I quote it right out of the book. There is a call for the church to recapture a robust apostolic calling and the practices needed for missional congregations. Churches must be continually moving out, extending themselves into the world, being the missional witnessing community that we're called to be. The manifestation of God's going into the world, crossing boundaries, proclaiming, teaching, healing, loving, serving, and extending the reign of God. Traditional churches will only become missionary churches as those in authority, and even those without formal authority, which we might call our vision team, develop capacity to lead their congregations through a long, truly transformational process that starts with the transformation of the leaders. It starts with the transformation of the leaders. Shall I say it again? It starts with us in this room. It's easy for us to say, if they would do this, if they would act this way, if the lay people would do this, it starts with those of us in this room. Conceptually stuck systems cannot become unstuck simply by trying harder. If we could just preach better, if we could just get it to look better, if we could just be more relevant, if we could just do it this way, trying harder will wear you out. There must be a fresh revelation that sparks passion, that restores hope. I don't intend for these two and a half days to be another conference where we take just business principles 
and adapt them to church life. This is not a quick fix. If that's what you're looking for, you're going to be greatly disappointed. This is not a magic bullet. This is not replicating one successful church. This is about taking first century biblically transferable principles, asking God to make them become alive in our lives. This is cross-cultural. I was in a cohort in Southern Cal, 17 churches. And you can hardly have more than 20 or 25 churches because if they all bring 8 to 15 people, you can see how big it can get. There was a Latino church. There was a Filipino church. There was a Vietnamese church. There was a Samoan church. There was a Nigerian church. There was some uh, Anglo churches. And when we were done with the cohort, the Nigerian pastor, all immigrants from Nigeria, said on video for us, Acts 2 was created just for the Nigerian church. I said, that's it. Because the Vietnamese church said the same thing. This is about renewed passion. Passionless leaders lead to hopeless followers. This is a renewed passion sparked by fresh revelation. You are going to hear principles that we teach that you're going to say, oh yeah, I know that. And you do. And they're going to sound redundant at times. But I can tell you, that's not exactly everything we're hoping you to get out of. This is God's plan for his church. And what we hope to do is to combine spirit and strategy together. And we want to just not develop something, but we want to discern something. So sitting in this room today are people that are hungry for God to show up in their midst. If we discern the plan, that's different than just development. If we develop our own plan, we have to defend it. If we discern God's plan through the Holy Spirit's help, he will defend it. That's right. Our goal is that each church would discern a plan that involves the passion of their leader, the abilities of their people, and the needs of their community. It has to be contextualized wherever that church is located.